Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I'd like to thank the Council of African Studies at the McMillan Center, specifically Nora Langett and Kristen Siebert for facilitating this conversation today. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Casey King. I'm the director of the Capstone Program at the Jackson Institute for Global Affairs. And I was the former executive director of the W.E.B. Du Bois Institute for African and African American Research at Harvard University. Um, at Yale, I've taught courses on Nigeria, working closely with the U.S. Department of State and the United Nations Counterterrorism Executive Directed, uh, focusing on the threat of Boko Haram and the challenge of reintegration of former militants. And it was in the course of that um, offering that I came to know uh, our guest today, Ambassador John Campbell. I was preparing a syllabus and, and reading avidly. And I came across his book, Nigeria, Dancing on the Brink, published in 2013. I reached out to Ambassador Campbell and asked him to come speak to the class uh, because it was, to me, one of the most incisive, honest, and uh, 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 synthetic works all within a, a single tone. So I was delighted that, uh, to, to get to know him there and then to later spend time with him at the uh, convocation of the Northern Nigerian Governors at the U.S. Institute of Peace in 2016. So I am delighted to welcome uh, Ambassador Campbell here today. Ambassador Campbell is the Ralph Bunch Senior Fellow for African Policy Studies at the Council on Foreign Relations in Washington, D.C. His new book, Nigeria and the Nation State, Rethinking Diplomacy with the Post-Colonial World, was just published in December of 2020, so only a few months out. Um, he also writes a blog, which is fascinating, uh, Africa and Transition. From 1975 to 2007, Ambassador Campbell served as a U.S. Department of State Foreign Service Officer. He served twice in Nigeria as a political counselor from 1988 to 1990, and as an ambassador from 2004 to 2007. Ambassador Campbell's additional overseas posting include Lyon, Paris, Geneva, and Pretoria. He also served as Deputy Assistant Secretary for Human Resources, and Dean of the Foreign Service Institute School of Language Studies, as well as the Director of the Office of UN Political Affairs. Um, I welcome you, Ambassador Campbell. So we, we will do a Zoom virtual clap welcoming uh, Ambassador Campbell, but a, a, a bit on format today. So um, I've invited Ambassador Campbell to give some uh, brief introductory comments uh, for about uh, 15 or 20 minutes. At that point, um, I, uh, after the introductory comments and sort of level set, um, we will open it up. Um, I will ask a few questions, but I really want um, all of these, uh, those of you in attendance to feel free and, uh, and, and um, empowered to post questions in chat so we can um, really open this up and make this a, a robust um, and fascinating discussion. Uh, so without further delay, to you, uh, Ambassador Campbell. Uh, <clears throat> thank you so much, Casey. And it's very good to be back in your class, uh, if only virtually. Um, the purpose of my book uh, is pretty simple. It's to warn Americans against making the same mistakes in Africa uh, that they did in Vietnam, Afghanistan, and Iraq. Uh, which has led to some 20 years uh, of warfare. Uh, Africa is complex. Its politics are local. It doesn't lend itself to a good versus evil analysis that so often distorts American policy. Uh, the book is particularly indebted to Richard Joseph, Stephen Ellis, and a host of Nigerian scholars who have worked to figure out how Nigeria works or how it doesn't work. Um, Richard Joseph has defined the way Nigeria works as essentially prebendal, building on top of patronage clientage uh, networks. And we can talk about what that means in the, uh, uh, in, the, in the discussion. 
The book is also indebted uh, to the National Intelligence Council, which articulated the insight that in many African countries and particularly Nigeria, government authority is largely restricted to certain islands. Islands in a sea, not of ungoverned spaces, but rather spaces that are governed by other entities, uh, such as jihadi groups, traditional rulers, in some cases governors, uh, increasingly in many cases now criminal networks. Up to now, the United States has largely avoided in Africa the mistakes that it made in Southeast Asia and the Middle East. Uh, this is not because of the wisdom of US Africa policy, nor the skills of American diplomats. Rather, the mistakes have been avoided because Africa has only rarely been a diplomatic preoccupation of the United States. We were never a colonial power. The reason for that, extremely interesting, because we had a naval squadron based off the West African coast once the international slave trade was rendered illegal. And there was an informal American colony established in Liberia. But no part of Africa has ever been directly ruled by the United States, unlike France, Germany, uh, or, or England. Um, Ambassador Herman Cohen suggests that the bottom line reason for this was the Louisiana Purchase, uh, to which I would add as well, Texas independence, because what both of those did was they focused US expansion towards the West rather than towards, uh, towards the, the outside, outside world. Um, more recently, Africa as a whole only contributes about 3% uh, to world trade. Uh, which means that um, U.S. economic interests in Africa have been small, uh, much smaller than our interests in East Asia, Europe, uh, or Latin America. So Africa has been largely a marginal preoccupation. U.S. policy towards Africa, marginal though it was, uh, has been largely unchanged since the early 1960s, and it's enjoyed bipartisan support. Uh, the pillars of it are encouraging economic development, strengthening African capacity to maintain its own security, and a predisposition to walling off Africa from great power rivalries. Um, adherence to the first two uh, has been pretty complete. Uh, the last, walling the continent off from great power rivalries, uh, that has largely been true, uh, though there have been exceptions, Congo, Angola, and in rhetoric, at least, some would like uh, a paradigm of U.S.-China rivalry to be extended to Africa, um, a paradigm that I would regard uh, as false. Um, for the American public, popular attention on Africa has largely focused on humanitarian disasters. Um, the point to emphasize is continuity. Uh, the Trump White House had no interest in Africa at all. Uh, it did have interest in barely cutting U.S. funding 
for international agencies uh, from which Africa particularly benefits. However, all of those efforts failed because of bipartisan support within the US Congress. And in fact, by the end of the Trump administration, uh, US funding for programs that benefit Africa was slightly higher than it had been uh, at the beginning of the administration. Now, I am arguing that in the coming decade, Africa is likely to become much more salient in American foreign policy, um, basically for four reasons. Demography, disease, security questions, and the potential for uh, enlarged markets and increased investment. Demography, Africa as a whole already has a population that is double that of North and Central America. Nigeria has a population of 214 million. Uh, by year 2050, it is anticipated that the population may be as high as 450 million. And in any event, it will have displaced the United States as the largest country in the world by population. This huge increase in population has all kinds of consequences. Uh, for one thing, the population is, particularly in Nigeria, is growing very much faster uh, than uh, uh, economic capacity, both industrial and agricultural. Hence, people are getting poorer. Their poverty is exacerbated by climate change, the results of which can be seen more clearly in Africa than almost any place else uh, in, in the world. The Sahara is creeping south. Sea levels in the Gulf of Guinea are rising faster than any other place in the world. And Lagos, Nigeria, with 21 million people, is at sea level. Put population increase, poverty, and climate change all together, and it becomes hard to imagine that massive migration flows out of Nigeria and West Africa won't happen. We have all seen the consequences of migration flows from Central and South America to the US or from the Middle East uh, into Europe and how destabilizing uh, those flows can be. So, demography. Secondly, disease. Population pressure is leading to the rapid destruction of the rainforest. Destruction of the rainforest makes it easier for diseases to jump from animals to humans. Uh, two notable examples, HIV AIDS, which apparently originated amongst bats and jumped to humans in the Congo, and Ebola in West Africa, where again, the origin may well have been bats, uh, but the disease jumped from an animal uh, to, uh, to humans. Uh, we have to anticipate that in the future, there will be more instances of this sort. And as we all know from the current pandemic, uh, disease cannot be corralled into a single country or even a single, uh, a single uh, con continent. So demography, disease. Thirdly, security. Um, jihadism is now firmly rooted in the Sahel. Uh, as it has been in the Horn of Africa. In the Sahel, there is the serious risk that the region will become a safe haven for military groups rather similar uh, to Afghanistan. Um, I would argue that these jihadi groups are certainly hostile to American interests, that they but that they do not pose a security threat to the United States at present. However, that could certainly change in the future. And then potential markets and investment. As the economy, as our economy becomes more and more dependent on digitalization and high tech, that puts increased emphasis and focus on strategic minerals, uh, many of which come. Uh, from, from Africa. And therefore, we have to anticipate 
that the continent will be the focus of more American economic interest uh, in, uh, in the future. If I argue that Africa as a whole is going to become more important to us over the next decade, you might ask, all right, why focus on Nigeria? Um, my answer to that is that a close study of Nigeria reveals profound tensions between the Nigerian state and its governing elite and the masses of its people. And that those insights may well help us to understand what's going on in certain other post-colonial societies. I also think that we really don't understand Africa, post-colonial societies, or Nigeria. I don't think we understand them very well. A potential root of our lack of understanding is wrapped up in the concepts and language that we use to think about it. Specifically, articulated first at the Congress of Westphalia in the 17th century is the concept of a nation state. And we, and the rest of the developed world, has widely applied these concepts to the post-colonial world, where often they do not fit very well. For example, unlike a conventional nation state, Nigeria lacks a unifying national identity and its people little identify with the Nigerian state. I had a fascinating conversation last week uh, with a Nigerian uh, woman, an intellectual, uh, who observed that she knew perfectly well what it meant to be a part of her family. She knew perfectly well what it meant to be a Christian. She knew perfectly well what it meant to be a Yoruba. She had no idea what it meant to, uh, to be a Nigerian. The concept of Nigerian nationality is marginal to a great many Nigerians. Nigeria was created by the British uh, for administrative convenience. They cobbled together some 300 different ethnic groups that had little in common and had never been part of the same political entity. Uh, Christianity and Islam and traditional religions are all, uh, uh, are all common. The conventional wisdom in Nigeria, uh, underscored by political reality, is that Christianity and Islam are about the same size, and therefore neither is a minority religion. Um, in fact, there are probably more Muslims than Christians. But traditional religion continues to play in an extremely important role, often beneath a veneer of Christianity uh, or Islam. So, Nigeria is uh, an artificial entity. Its boundaries were lines drawn on a piece of paper by European colonial powers based in London, Paris, and Berlin. Uh, Cameroon in those days was a, uh, was, a German, um, was a German colony. These lines on a piece of paper took no account um, of ethnic or other on the ground realities. And certainly the people who live there uh, were, not, uh, were not consulted. After independence, Nigeria became independent in 1960. After uh, independence, the Nigerian government was quickly captured by a small cartel of self-serving elites that cooperate across religious and ethnic divisions just enough to divvy up state oil revenue amongst themselves and their clients. Oil revenue with unimaginable riches uh, came online at exactly the same time the country emerged from a devastating civil war 
and without any institutions that could channel the wealth produced by oil. Even now, Nigeria produces some 2 million barrels of oil a day. Uh, and most of the time, it's the largest oil producer uh, uh, in, uh, in Africa. The elites that captured the state have had no interest in and done virtually nothing to improve the lot of the vast majority of Nigerians. This is a process that has been extensively analyzed by Richard Joseph, uh, Stephen Ellis, and a host of Nigerian scholars. As I have already mentioned, government authority certainly is not coterminous with the boundaries of Nigeria. It rather does consist of islands in a sea of space governed by other, other entities. How did Nigeria get this way? I argue uh, in certain broad themes that run through the book that first, Nigeria's challenges were not inevitable, but that they have deep historical roots that stretch back to the colonial and post-colonial period. Secondly, that the country's leadership has been poor and self-centered. Third, and related to number two, the goal of Nigeria's political culture has been and is the preservation of elite wealth and privilege. But that culture is now under assault, especially by jihadi radicalism and by a new assertion of ethnic identity, all exacerbated by the slow disintegration of central government authority. So rather than a nation state, Nigeria is a collection of numerous languages, histories, and cultures, not yet united, governed by a weak state in conjunction with, and often uh, uh, opposed by other power structures, all in the context of networks funded by oil. Bleak but Nigeria is too big and too important for us to ignore. Nigeria is in trouble. It is fighting bandits in the Northwest, militants in the South, terrorists in the Northeast. There are ethnic and religious conflicts. There are quarrels over land and water use, which often acquire an ethnic or a religious um, color, coloration. A weak national identity and underdeveloped state structures facilitate the elite cartel's exploitation of national wealth for private purposes. Now, given these realities, as in many other post-colonial countries, the ever resilient develop workarounds often involving family, religion, and ethnicity, often greased by corruption. But these workarounds rarely make reference to formal government structures. Now, given these realities, a challenge for policymakers, diplomats, foreign corporations, is how to maintain a relationship with an increasingly weak and absent government and a fracturing political system. I would suggest that a place to start is to identify those areas where mutually beneficial cooperation is still possible and those issues where outsiders may have a positive impact. Here is the problem. Those kinds of distinctions require a granular knowledge of how Nigeria works. A granular knowledge that we don't have and that we lacked in Vietnam, Afghanistan, and Iraq. 
and led to a host of policy failures. Let me give you some specific examples of some of the conundrums that American policymakers face. For example, expanded US military cooperation with the Nigerian army against jihadi terrorism. Such cooperation has been stymied by the Nigerian army's ongoing human rights abuses. And those abuses are not likely to ameliorate anytime soon. Does shared concern about Islamic jihadist penetration of the Sahel outweigh the manifest human rights abuses of the Nigerian security services? Further, what are the long-term costs of closer American identification with the Nigerian army amongst the mass of the Nigerian population. Another example. Um, what will be the consequences for US interests of US advocacy of gay rights in deeply homophobic Nigeria? There are similar dilemmas in, say, Pakistan or the Democratic Republic of the Congo, where American strategic and economic interests very often clash with democratic values. Democratic values in the United States, but also democratic values in the countries um, that we're talking about. It seems to me that to work our way through these dilemmas and to develop the kind of understanding that we need, we policymakers and diplomats are talking to the wrong people about the wrong things. We are assuming Nigeria is a conventional state, conventional nation state. So our diplomatic activity is mostly with the presidency and the foreign ministry. Much of the conversation is about security issues and about election mechanics. Our diplomatic presence is only in two places in that enormous country, Abuja, the capital, and Lagos, the commercial capital. Hence, in many cases, our ignorance is profound. We know very little about the internal structure of Boko Haram. We understand very little about the informal militias that operate in the Niger Delta. Most of the time, we don't really understand uh, the quarrels over land and water use and to easily slide into a paradigm that sees it as a conflict between Christian farmers and Muslim uh, herdsmen. It's considerably more, uh, more complicated than that. <clears throat> the problem is, faced with multiple challenges, power is ebbing away from the central government toward traditional states, traditional rulers, religious leaders, uh, 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 high school teachers, high school principals, all are a part of a population uh, with which we have very little dialogue. If we are to understand what is really going on, to say nothing of trying to influence events, we need a dialogue that is much closer to the ground. That requires a decentralized diplomatic presence. I would suggest that we need to reduce the size of the embassy in Abuja and the consulate in Lagos and redeploy resources toward the establishment of smaller offices scattered around the country. I would start small. I would establish these branch offices uh, in uh, each of the, um, the sort of four largest administrative um, uh, regions. There, 
based on these branch offices, we would pursue a diplomatic strategy of outreach to religious and traditional um, opinion makers. This would imply a shift of focus from Abuja and Lagos, uh, Abuja and Lagos based elites to a much broader spectrum of Nigeria's population. It also implies uh, a much greater emphasis on soft diplomacy, more exchange programs involving religious leaders, judges, state governors, the provision of enhanced training opportunities for, for journalists. I would also suggest that we could do much to encourage private American initiatives with respect to Nigeria, outreach to Nigeria, that is often extraordinarily successful. Um, I want to end by telling you uh, a, uh, a little story. It's a kind of upbeat conclusion to what have been fairly grim observations. Um, there is a private group of people in Iowa that have organized yearly exchange programs with Nigerian Muslim high school students from the north. They go and they live on farms in Iowa uh, or in small, in small towns for a year. Their host families uh, are uh, very careful to ensure that they get to a mosque uh, on Friday. Who would have known that there's a network of mosques in Iowa, but there is. When those students go back to Northern Nigeria, and I usually met with them when they, when they came back, their act was like yeast in dough. Their, their personal stories did much to demolish the automatic presumption uh, in Northern Nigerian, Northern Nigeria, that Americans are hostile to Islam. We could help them and we could help them more than we do. And I'll stop there. Thank you, Ambassador Campbell for that really uh, packed, packed overview. And, and, and I wanna encourage people to, uh, I'm gonna actually uh, put, put your book up in the, uh, I'm gonna share my screen and, um, oh, host disabled. Um, okay, so I'm not going to share your screen, but I'm going to put a link to the book because I, I really think it's uh, it's fascinating. As I said to you um, earlier, I, I spent the weekend um, on my Kindle reading it, and um, it really is a call, to me, it's a call to action uh, for, for U.S. State Department at this critical juncture in our history to rethink the way we, we approach um, diplomacy. Um, your, your calls for a more agile, decentralized approach is, is fascinating to me. But, but how does one reconcile the security challenges in a post-Benghazi era where any mistake, any loss of life can destroy a, a, a state a secretary or any of their staff's uh, political careers? How does one reconcile that sort of security risk with a decentralized approach first? And secondly, um, you know, we, we have this sort of weak nation state notion. You, you say at uh, one point in your book that the, the notion of nation and state, um, although all but interchangeable for American policymakers, is, is this sort of fiction for most Nigerians. So you, you, you say that we must support this notion of a centralized federal state and this sort of, uh, even though it's loosely organized, wouldn't these decentralized approach fundamentally undermine that call to unity? I know when we met with the Northern Nigerian governors in, in, at the U.S. Institute of Peace, I was monitoring some of the press back in Nigeria, and I saw this sort of conspiracy theories emerge from the Southern Nigerian press about what was going on with the Northern Nigerian governments when we made just such an effort. So, I mean, I, I guess I'd like you to respond to those two points. Does it fundamentally under undermine our effort to support a, a, a national federal state? And secondly, how do we have a decentralized approach uh, in, in the face of security risks? 
Uh, let me take the second question first, um, uh, because that's the easier one. Um, first of all, we know how to provide necessary security uh, for diplomats in quasi-war zones. Uh, we've done it in Pakistan, uh, we've done it in Afghanistan, we've done it in Iraq. Uh, the Israelis have done it all kinds of different places. Uh, in the short term, it's expensive. Uh, and the reason why it hasn't been done has been appeals to, uh, uh, to budgetary realities. But I would also point out that the centralized approach that we follow, keeping our diplomats essentially in fortresses in Abuja and in Lagos, uh, and essentially out of touch with so much of what is going on in the country, that is likely to lead to policy mistakes as it did in Vietnam, Afghanistan, and Iraq, that are vastly more expensive than the increased costs of providing um, sufficient security. The question of whether there is a conflict between decentralized diplomacy and support for the Nigerian government in Abuja, I think shouldn't be framed quite that way. In other words, I think our focus should be on diplomatic outreach to Nigeria, to the Nigerian people, of which the government is only one element. By the way, I saw this in operation. I saw this in operation in South Africa in the last days of apartheid, uh, and um, the transition to non-racial uh, democracy, where our relationship with the apartheid government in Pretoria, which was then the legal government of the country, were perfectly correct uh, and up to a point even cordial. But that was not where the, the, the thrust of our diplomatic activity was. The thrust of our diplomatic activity was with NGOs, with opposition movements, with civil society in general. And in that particular case, um, we played a positive, if largely unsung, role in the success of the transition to non-racial democracy. So in other words, I think you can do it. You have to be nimble, you have to be skillful, um, but I think you can avoid making it a kind of either or uh, uh, situation. I'm on mute. Okay. So, you know, just, just to follow up, um, I understand that we can do this, but is there a political appetite to support that given that the, re the response to the Tonga Tonga ambush was uh, it was was catastrophic, where life lost in Iraq and Afghanistan um, seemed to be tolerated by the American public and American politicians to a much greater extent than any loss of life on the African continent. So I wonder, um, I, I know it's technically possible and from a military standpoint, possible. I, I, I'm just, I, I wonder if we have the political appetite. Um, I actually did a social media study of all of Twitter and I looked at the response in all of Twitter to loss of life in Afghanistan versus loss of life uh, on the African continent. And um, the negative uh, response uh, among the general public and the, the length of that negative response uh, was both in magnitude and duration far greater than the response. And, and it's almost as though we, we don't think Africa matters. Uh, it's well, not I, think, a I think that's exactly right. Uh, uh, and U.S. domestic politics here played a major role. I mean, uh, what did Benghazi become? Benghazi became essentially a partisan um, whip uh, to attack um, uh, the, the then sitting administration. Um, your observation about popular response to loss of life, you mentioned Tonga Tonga. We could also talk about the, uh, it happened 20 years earlier, the killing of American soldiers as part of Black, Black Hawk Down, which led to an American recessional in Africa, which arguably contributed to the Rwanda genocide. But I would suggest that the compelling reasons why we have to pay more attention to Africa in the coming decade 
uh, helps modify that. I am very encouraged by the fact that the Biden administration's um, ambassador to the UN, uh, and she sits in the, in the cabinet, Linda Thomas Greenfield, uh, was a career foreign service officer. Most of her career um, was in Africa. And in fact, while I was ambassador to Nigeria, she was my deputy assistant secretary. Um, uh, she was essentially my link um, uh, back, back to Washington. Tony Blinken, uh, the new Secretary of State, also has a long, long history uh, of, uh, of engagement with Africa and a sense uh, of, the, of the continent's coming, coming importance. Uh, there are also uh, interesting and increasingly outspoken uh, advocates for greater engagement in Africa. Uh, uh, I'm thinking specifically of Senator Chris Coons, for example, from, um, uh, from Delaware, who approach African issues, not from the perspective of charity, and not from the perspective of racially motivated politics in the United States, but rather from the perspective of UN, uh, US national interests. And I think there, political leadership matters. I think it matters a lot. Thank you. Um, so turning to our audience, we have some fascinating questions coming in the Q&A, one of which comes from a rector at the American Liberal Art University in Congo, uh, Monty Murchie. Murky, Murky, I believe it is. Um, and he, he writes, please allow me to state your critical analysis inclusive in prescriptive considerations is spot on. Unfortunately, political publics for this Canadian is transactional in retention of power in US and or Canada. My 30 plus years in Africa support your analysis. How then can this development a paradigm be shifted as do-goodism is neither uh, effective nor capable in amelioration of elite state capture evinced in your correct opine vis-a-vis -vis Nigeria. I'm not quite sure I, I, I'm getting the question, but let me keep reading. Maybe there's, there's a question at the bottom, which is, uh, therefore, how to redirect development efforts in order for de development assistance be effectively deployed to Nigerian interlocutors who understand extant notions of moral obligation and interpersonal accountability in the region? Um, it's a good question. Uh, and the answer is difficult. Um, while I was in ambassador to Nigeria, uh, the Bush administration launched the PEPFAR program and Nigeria was a PEPFAR country. Uh, and that involved uh, a massive transfer of resources from the US government essentially to, yes, the Federal Ministry of Health, but also to a great many uh, Nigerian non-governmental organizations. It's difficult because the infrastructure that US assistance presupposes very largely didn't exist. By infrastructure, I'm not talking about hospitals and roads. I'm talking about things like common accounting practices. Well, if you're spending public money uh, in the United States, you have to account for it. You have to account for it down to the very last penny. To do that, you have to have in place a kind of accounting infrastructure, uh, which was very largely absent. That meant we had to develop it, uh, which we did, but it took time and it took patience. I think probably my bottom line answer to the questioner would be that it's a slow process and it's something that you have to do basically one step at a time. Great, thank you for that. Um, our next question um, comes from Catherine. She, she, she writes, Will the outreach to four regions even be enough? Why not even more than four regions, maybe rotating them with a sort of rotational system? Uh, I agree with her. Uh, I entirely agree with her that uh, I would say four regions is merely a down payment. Um, I suggest four because I could imagine staffing four 
out of the present complement in Abuja and in Lagos. If you were going to increase the number, then you'd have to increase the number of diplomats deployed to Nigeria. And that would have significant budgetary uh, 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 impl implications. In other words, I think you can talk about four. They'd be far more desirable if you could talk about 24, but I'm afraid that, um, that politically that simply wouldn't be realistic, at least in over the next five years. Um, you know, in, in your book, there is, you know, there, there is this underlying um, movement of, of, of disunity uh, among the different tribes, the different groups, the different states, the different religions. And, and as you say in your book, uh, you know, history matters and understanding the context of the creation of Nigeria, which is almost a, you know, a, a colonial fiction, if you will. Uh, the amalgamation, um, and, and, and clearly it's, it's, it's challenged currently. Um, as you pointed out um, last week, against the immediate backdrop of the mass kidnappings, jihadi resurgence, and growing separatist sentiment in old Biafra, conflict over water and land that often assumes a religious and ethnic coloration, uh, the Catholic Bishops' Conference of Nigeria issued a statement sounding an alarm over the very survival of the nation. That's right. So, do you think that's an overstatement? Is the nation itself at, at, at risk of, if not, uh, you know, of a, a major humanitarian crisis that would ensue with any sort of uh, splintering or, or civil war? Um, a great many Nigerians think so. Um, uh, it's, it's interesting talking about Nigeria as a colonial construct. Um, lots of Nigerians will tell you that the country remains essentially a colonial entity. The only difference is that the British left uh, and were replaced by um, a, an indigenous network uh, of elites. I don't think the country will actually formally break up. Uh, the reason for that is that the Nigerian state owns the oil and it is through the Nigerian state that the cooperating and competing elites have access to the oil. If in fact Nigeria were to break up, all of that oil revenue would presumably be corralled by, by one actually geographically rather small part of the country uh, in the Niger Delta. Uh, and I think that would be completely unacceptable uh, uh, to the other elite networks. So I think the country, the country will continue to be on the map, continue to have a diplomatic service, continue to have um, a weak um, uh, military and an even weaker police. And uh, the central government will become ever less important, but it won't go away. It will still be there. Interesting. Uh, the call to support a unified Nigerian state uh, in the face of so much pressure and the recognition of how there's no clear uh, self-concept of such, no clear narrative, no clear patriotism. It, it, during the Biafra um, independence movement, many of our Peace Corps volunteers and other uh, uh, officials you know, really supported um, Biafra, whereas the US government policy was towards a federal state. That's right. Uh, you, you talk about including more and more informal mechanisms and avenues of of conversation and support of Nigeria, but isn't that an example of uh, what Lane Meyer says in, in her comment is a disconnect that you've observed between US security and, uh, and national policy versus development aid policy in Nigeria. If we are opening up these informal mechanisms, how do we make sure that something like the Biafra disconnect, which persists today, uh, the suspicion persists today about our role in that, um, how, how, do we, how do we manage that? <laughs> you have to manage it carefully. Uh, and uh, it's the kind of group that I am thinking of uh, where the cooperation could be particularly fruitful uh, is between the American Bar Association, the Nigerian Bar Association, uh, the, I'm sorry, the National Bar Association and the Nigerian Bar Associations. In other words, uh, not territorially based, 
uh, but rather functionally uh, based. Um, Biafra is cautionary. Uh, as you said, the federal government's policy was to support federal Nigeria. As we can tell, American public opinion, first of all, was largely disengaged. But insofar as it was engaged, it tended to support Biafra. Again, back to granule knowledge. The Biafrans were extremely clever, particularly after the first nine months of the Civil War, to shift the perception of their independence movement to one of Christians attempting to throw off a Muslim yoke. Now, it was considerably more complicated than that. But that narrative combined with very clever uh, Biafran um, propaganda, the picture of the starving Biafran child, for example, that has become almost the poster for starvation in Africa. Uh, that had a real impact on an American public that had almost no knowledge uh, of, of, uh, of realities. Now, what's sort of distressing about all of this is if you go back and you look at the records, the official American knowledge of what was going on was similarly blinkered. It was certainly not more sophisticated. And there, the concerns were, what would the Soviet Union do? How could it benefit? Further, the British were strong supporters um, of, of, of national unity. They were our closest allies. In other words, the role played by peripheral issues. Um, uh, when I looked at the records, I found it, um, I found it disconcerting. Um, there has also been, there's been some interesting work done uh, now that the, uh, uh, that the statute of, of um, limitations has expired, the 30-year rule has expired. It's interesting how little the CIA actually knew. Interesting. And, and what is the failure of intelligence? How do you account for it? Is it the lack of these sort of decentralized networks of, uh, of, of contact and intelligence gathering? Is it just, uh, again, the sort of feeling that we, we don't really worry about the African continent as Americans. What is it in particular that- I think, it's, I think it's, it's all of the above. It was um, a lack of, lack of resources, um, lack of background uh, by people on the ground. Um, as you know, uh, uh, foreign service practice is that you rotate officers every two, three, or at most, at most four years and officers are all worldwide available. Um, for example, uh, my academic background is in British and French history. Uh, my initial posts in the Foreign Service were Lyon, Paris, and Geneva, all appropriate to my particular background. Uh, suddenly, the political counselor position in Nigeria became open because the serving political counselor got moved to Johannesburg to be consul general because the consul general in Johannesburg suddenly retired. So you had as the head of the political section uh, in Nigeria, that is to say me, a person with zero African experience and all but zero knowledge uh, of Africa as a continent. Yeah, and, and then you have me interviewing you where uh, Catherine makes a good point that it's short eye, not long eye in Biafra. So thank you for that, Catherine. I really appreciate that. Uh, in our audience today, we have a, a student of mine at the Jackson Institute who's a Wrangell Fellow, and he's going off to the State Department when he graduates this year, Mike Wisner, um, unless it's a long eye, Mike. Uh, from the perspective of the State Department, do you have ideas on how to attract top talent want to serve in new consulate in places like Kaduna. So um, I know Mike's very interested in, in serving in Africa. So I, I know this is a very personal question for him. Uh, yes, uh, I have lots of ideas about that. 
Uh, let's start with expanding the teaching of African languages at the Foreign Service Institute. <coughs> Excuse me. At the very least, the, the Institute should be teaching Swahili, uh, which it does from time to time. Um, it should, at the very least, be teaching Hausa, which is a relatively easy language for, uh, uh, for Westerners to learn, and it's a kind of lingua franca straight across, uh, straight across Africa. Secondly, I would suggest that if a person is really interested in, uh, in serving in Africa, and particularly at, uh, at a very small post, say a place like the embassy in Mauritania or, or in Niger, um, what he needs to do is from the very beginning, speak up. Because the line of foreign service officers that want to serve in such places does not exactly stretch around the block. Now, this can also be career enhancing because it means that a relatively junior officer very early on can acquire significant um, professional responsibility and, and experience. Uh, and that looks good to promotion boards. Well, uh, sadly, we are now uh, at time. I want to thank uh, Ambassador John Campbell again, the book. Nigeria and the Nation State Rethinking Diplomacy with the Post Colonial World, a wake up call for uh, US policymakers uh, and recognition of how new approaches to effective diplomacy must be affected, uh, emphasizing the importance of history and, and, and understanding the complexity of a state and, and not making these rudimentary and uh, simplistic assumptions that have led to such uh, incredible missteps uh, throughout the world in the last. 20 years and, and beyond. So we are very fortunate to have you uh, speak to us today, Ambassador Campbell, very fortunate that um, you published this book at a, quite a propitious time and I hope you all will um, read it. And, and um, I look forward to your next, if, if not your next visit to my, to my class at Yale. Thank you. Thank you all for attending as well. And thanks to Nora and Kristen Siebert and the Macmillan um, Center and the Council for African Studies. Have a and thank you for having me. Oh, you're quite welcome. It's an honor and a privilege, sir, as always.